thank you for the two presentations. Um, okay, I think I'm just going to start and then we can we can open it up. Or oh, are there like any very pressing? Yeah, very good. Pressing questions. Ursula, um, how were you able to take genetically modified organisms out of the laboratory? Actually, um, this was a speculative artwork, and uh, we didn't use that for the microphone. Things on? <laughs> Just speak into it. Yeah, it's not working. Uh, now it's working, okay. Um, so we were, we were in a collaboration with uh, the University of Heidelberg and they had as two labs, so we would have had the possibility to do genetic modifications, but of course, we decided to go to the iGEM competition, not to run for the competition, but instead to make a kind of art presentation. Heidelberg had two teams, a scientific team and an art team, and the art team was mixed. Half of them were scientists and half were artists, and we just wished to make a political statement. And that was more important than uh, having a, a biopic or a new um, modification, genetic modification. That is not the way we express our, um, our thoughts for the moment. It would, be, would have been a huge challenge just for the students. What was the reaction of the researchers? Or undergrads? Or, I mean, I imagine there was the a big room of... The students, the, the, the reaction when, I, when we first had uh, or took the decision to go there was that they don't want to harm their karma and working with genetics. No, no I mean, I mean the. At the jury, you mean they? I think we had the longest dis discussion ever at ITEM. It was yeah. about 45 minutes, and uh, they they don't didn't know how to react. Yeah. So. I think we have to say what iGEM is actually. So iGEM is this, um, it's called International Genetically Machines, Genetically Engineered Machines Competition. Um, and this is a big gathering basically that was set up by the synthetic biology, uh, by a couple of people like Randy, for example, who basically wanted to have this like undergraduate meeting every year where people would work on projects and would then basically like meet in this kind of like Olympics of genetics and they're all like, kids basically and then do these projects and then there's like awards and the big bio break and it's grown in I haven't been following it that closely but it grew from like a really tiny thing to like a massive event and it's at MIT in Boston every year and then yeah and then like more and more there were actually like designers and artists involved as well um, because it's like a very intrinsically creative event or design of the event could I, could I maybe ask a question from like the deep end, <laughs> and saying like in the very beginning, you said that that um, there's a certain consensus that bio art has to do with living things. What did you mean by that, and what's your own position? I think that's quite interesting. Maybe a bit of that. Sure. Uh, so, yeah, I, I feel like there is a a loose consensus that. Bioart is, is uh, to use the alliterative icky phrase, moist media, that you have to be working with bacteria or mosses or, or, or living stuff. And uh, I, I strongly feel that it's, I'm claiming this other territory for it that includes photography, sculpture, performance, video. Um, so that's what I mean. And do you, do you consider, I mean, if somebody does like very theoretical, th like if somebody did very theoretical things that consider this themselves with the living substrate, would that qualify less in a way as somebody than, than I mean, I'm being like devil's advocate, obviously. Like, yeah, you know, like, well, do you have to go to the lab to be like a bio artist? I don't think so. And it, it's, you know, some of it depends on the question, is it good? What, what, what's done? <laughs> and, and yeah, so I think it, um, yeah, it's more it's more open than that. Hmm. Also, and, and, um, interesting, interesting to bring up Xkul, I think, because Xkul is kind of I think it, there's like a certain renaissance of Xkul 
happening. So UXCO is like Umwelt, for, for those who don't speak German, so Umwelt is basically means environment. And UXCO in this book, what's it called? A stroll through animals and uh, the tick and its environment. Um, right? Um, so that basically was, was the origin of the notion of the environment. So that's, and, but I thought it was quite interesting that you, that you mentioned this, or like you, sh I don't know if it was in the slide or if you said, but there's a certain like de, no, right, what Agamben said, that there's a dehumanization that happened with Uxku because he was working, you know, contemporaneously with all these like quantum physics people. So basically like they were looking at like what the complete other is that we might not have access to. But I'm wondering if there's like a rehumanization going on right now with like, the, the, you know, the notion of the Anthropocene and, and that suddenly maybe we did much more than, you know, and what you take on, on maybe this kind of like... I, I don't think so. Or, or at least I don't hope so. Uh, um, I think it's pretty necessary that we um, are just having had the contact to biotechnology. It has become necessary for me to step back a little bit and also to deal with genetic engineering when we collaborated with Heidelberg. Um, it's still today so complicated to understand for an artist what that means. I mean in an artistic way or in a cultural way. And uh, if it makes sense for an artist to contribute to science or technology, we, we need to bring our world in contact with the scientific world and to see for the overlaps. We need to understand from a cultural standpoint what's going on there, and that is not easy. Mm. And um, so Uxkul was, for me, um, the, the person I found just to, to be sure that on the long run I I can have my own approach, even to biotechnology. Hmm. And, um, because you share the same Umwelt, eventually. Umwelt, yeah. No, no, I mean, like, the, you and the scientists, like, if you kind of, like, extend it to, like, the societal notion, then, you know, it's the same, like, the society is the Umwelt of the, both the scientist and you. So, uh, yeah, I, just uh, remembering also our first lecture, I was thinking, so um, I would like to invite everybody here to join us um, on Sunday at 3 o'clock at the coffee stage at the Transmediale because our students, they will do that in, in the social field or in society. Um, they experiment with swarm behaviors, but also with um, um, completely simple things. Uh, it's about decision making and it's called the mess with tech and a series of performances where they do no specific artwork, but only mm. try That's to interact. at HKW, right? HKW. At Transmediale. Um, maybe it's a good moment to actually open it up. I mean, I definitely have more questions, but I want to... Ah, yeah, perfect. Um, do we have more microphones? Than, no. <coughs> Moist. <laughs> Nature has very different scales, and the large scale, scale is not wet necessarily. So I, I think that this is an unnecessary restriction. You know, why, why do we do we wet? I mean, look outside. You have sure. Flock. I mean, if you look at, at birds uh, in the savanna, I mean, everything. Nature is always moist in a sense, but you're thinking of uh, wet, the wet lab. Right. I, I think that should clarify what, what I'm saying is that I object to the limitation of it must be moist or it must be in the lab or it must be living. And that instead, how I'm thinking about bioart is its relation to the changes in our concepts of life, nature, and identity, which is, which is much broader. Yeah, good. Uh, can I, can I, uh, what, what, uh, at what point of, the, of, your, uh, of your presentation did it shift from reality to uh, concept? Uh, so, uh, the, 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 yeah. Uh, that's, that's a good point. So, um, 
I, I was raised as a conventional artist or sculptor, and I always want to work with the stuff and the material. So um, uh, this is my only speculative work, the last we saw, and all the others are not non-fictional. So I always want to work with the stuff, the material, but um, this is not your question. Your question is also no, the about que the, que the question is, I mean, Concept. the uh, um, the fact that uh, that midgets react to sound is this mm -hmm. this is real or is this also this or is real this, this is, is real, real. right yeah. so so you could very well imagine that you create a standing sound wave uh, yes. uh, where where the midgets actually move too yeah. of course if you take the sound away mm -hmm. the structure is gone if we have time later I have it on my computer there you can see we had a cello player and she was playing with the midgets yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hi, uh, I have a question for Ursula. Um, I don't know the work of von Uxel very well, but it seems that he is trying to make an, a, a sort of sensory analysis of how other organisms sense their surrounding uh, and thereby make contact with others. But um, you seem to um, want to work with that notion in order to, and that's, that's the question, uh, do you also work with that notion in order to bring uh, different species more close to each other? Or in other words, bring humans or make humans more aware of the other species and be with them more respectful? Um, so you have a, have, do you have a, an agenda there that is more? I have an agenda, yes. Unfortunately, I was much too slow, and um, I couldn't show the, the last things, the latest things. Um, the agenda would be first, um, and that is not only uh, I'm suggesting Uxke for that, creating interfaces for humans and animals that you design uh, interfaces which allows humans to sense how the animals are sensing. Lisa Jeffred is doing that, uh, for uh, instance, and, and also others. Um, but um, I'm more interested in the habitat, in the shared habitat. So creating the our, um, domains of consensus in the sense of Maturana, uh, that you have a sh an environment where you feel comfortable with the creatures and where you can share the same experiences. And um, sometimes that is already possible uh, with creatures and sometimes you have to, to enhance your senses or you, have, you need tools for that or a different environment. And if, if it's about the environment, then um, we see also that Uxku was not only a biologist, but he was an inventor from the also from the Umwelt term, from the Umweltforschung. And that, on the long run, is, is a perspective, in my opinion. Thank you. I actually have a question that kind of like relates to the trajectory, maybe a little bit. Because, like, I mean, like, his exclusive work, I don't know, there's like a certain in this kind of like in the book about the tick, for example. It felt like really there's like a certain like empathy moment, like can we understand the tick at all, you know? And then that like in the fascinating things that you showed, like it really went into interfaces, like designing like this dog walker I thought was totally incredible because it's like a machine basically that adapts, it's almost like gear, it's gears, you know? It's very strange with the walking and the steps. But I'm wondering, is there actually, my, do, you, do you think there's a progression towards like actual compatibility in the sense that you can really, what you said in the beginning, share thoughts with an animal? Because I mean, that's what we use language for, right? I mean, but if you think about like the far future of these things, and you do you think there's like a, some sort of sense that goes beyond the interface thing that you've been working on? Um, I mean, you don't have to have an answer. Of course, <laughs> I think that there, there is a deeper understanding between yeah. humans and animals. Um, that is perhaps nothing I would like to speak about, but more making work about it and, or make it whisper or at least that you can estimate what's going on. That is, it's difficult because perhaps we have a different yeah. language. Or let me rephrase, which one of your works you think is 
the most successful at actually coming, or which comes closest to that? If yeah, the video with uh, the cello player and the midges, where yeah. uh, the friend cello player, she played with a swarm of midges, and um, she tried to find the, the, the sounds which make the swarms alter their shape. shape. And that worked, yeah. and it not only worked, but we wish to have it work in a nice way. And it's just pure aesthetics, and perhaps we, we are wrong, I don't know. Yeah. But at least they reacted to us. Okay. And, uh, and one, one, one night I, I woke up, and um, by the sound of a swarm of midges in my, in my home. And I can't tell you how beautiful that was. Uh, the sound is very, not very loud, and normally you don't wake up by that. But I waited for so long time that the midges are swarming in my home. And I, my aquarium is not very big, it's a bit like that. But um, I was playing flute during the day, and these are sounds. <laughs> I was just glad that it happened. So there is emotion in the whole thing. And, uh, but perhaps it's projection, I don't know. Mm. You had a question. So those were some lovely images you just described. I'm curious about, uh, similar to what was asked just a moment ago about agenda, if this generating greater empathy, which I feel like your work does, if you do you imagine or do you want it to lead to a particular larger outcome? For example, should we be on the way to granting rights to certain species? And if so, how would we go about doing that? I could speak about that, but I don't know if an artist is the right person to speak about the rights. Uh, of course, tomorrow I will do that on the panel from Lucas. Uh, but I think uh, the first thing I would like to do is to make the people more sensitive or uh, that they pay attention to their um, ability for empathy and to deepen that and uh, I think that is um, an easier way for an artist to change something and uh, uh, laws without empathy. They, uh, are very difficult to um, to keep. Just short observation. I think very it is very important to uh, that uh, scientists and artists uh, learn each about each other's work, uh, because I think uh, it's uh, always was very def uh, divided, and it's very difficult. And I think science is going so far that it's necessary to get exactly the sensibilities mm -hmm. of others to get another notion of development of science. And I think this is one of the points I think that artists should work with science, scientists and other way around probably so that artists also learn something that they don't understand and that it's a part of our life. Thank you. I appreciate that, that observation. I'd say that it, uh, maybe it wasn't always so, that I think prior to the 18th century, there was like, more convergence between uh, the sciences and, and the arts. Definitely some of the practitioners, going back to the Renaissance and before, were um, counted as both. But I think there's also this danger in uh, wanting or, or facilitating more convergence now, because although it can have good outcomes, I. I worry about this potential self-censorship that happens on the, on the side of the artist when they're working with scientists, when they're working with the resources of labs, when they're working with large organizations that fund this stuff. And there's, even if it's unintentional, there's, I think there's this like kind of pressure, at least I have a hunch, that there's this pressure to not be so critical of these huge mechanisms that fund research, that fund the application of biotechnologies. <laughs> 